Hi. Everyone's happy we got long holidays coming up? God, I'm going to give you more reason to be happy here tonight because God is going to do something wonderful as He always does, but today I think it's going to be just that little more wonderful. Say amen. I was in Mass this week and I was listening to a gospel reading. And it told a beautiful story. Actually, it told a couple of beautiful stories. And I'm going to share that with you now because I think we need to really get hope from these stories. Jesus was in this town and a man called Jairus goes to Jesus and tells him that his daughter is at home very sick and dying. So Jesus said, I will come and see her. And as he was making his way to this girl's house, a woman, bleeding for 12 years, reached across to Jesus and touched the hem of his garment. And instantly, she was healed. And I always wonder, and I hope that you also wonder, how often we think, And we've been struggling for the longest time. We've been going to doctors. We've been going to counselors. We've been going to people for all kinds of help and nothing has been happening. Imagine how this woman must have felt. Door after door after door she knocked. Person after person after person she sought help from. And nothing, nothing happened at all. And then she heard about Jesus. And with simple faith... She didn't go to talk to him. She didn't go to him with a long list of requests. She didn't get on knees and pray and fast for hours. In simple faith, she reached out and touched the hem of Jesus' garment and she was healed. What an awesome story of hope, is it not? But there's another story that follows this one. And it takes place when Jesus reaches the house of this child who is sick and dying. He gets the news that she is already dead. Put yourself for a moment because I know some of you are in situations like this. When you think that things in your life are dead, are over. Your marriage is is in pieces and it can't be fixed. It is dead. Your finances are in such desperate trouble that it is dead. Or that you are struggling with something that is so bad you might as well be dead. And you declare it dead. And Jesus says to you as he said to the people around him, he said, No, she's only sleeping. And they laughed at him. He ignored their laughter. He doesn't care much about people mocking him. He walks into this house where this child is lying in a bed and he says, Talitha kum, which means little girl wake up. And the little girl got to her feet. Today the dead is coming back to life in this church today. Say amen. Amen. I don't care what is wrong in your lives. I don't care how much trouble you're in. I don't care how much debt you're burdened with. I don't care if your marriage is in ruins. I don't care if you're about to go to jail. I'm saying to you today that God is going to change everything. Why? Because he's here. Now, the only problem with saying that is we listen to these words week after week after week. We see miracles taking place week after week after week. But for some reason, we are still struggling day after day after day. Wonderful things are happening in my life. Wonderful things are happening in this ministry Yesterday, for instance, we opened our 51st School of Discipleship in Melbourne, Australia. Tomorrow we're opening our 52nd school in St. Vincent and the Grenadines in the Caribbean. 
God is working in a ministry like he's never worked in any ministry in the history of the church since the early days of the church. Do you ever wonder why? I'm going to tell you why. Because over the last six months especially, we've been starting to preach about grace and not about the law, which sometimes we have been guilty of doing. And the reason God blesses grace is because truly it is grace that we need to live the life that Jesus has given us. Otherwise, it wouldn't be good news, would it? And yet we struggle. Yet we face difficulties and we're burdened with despondency, depression, and doubt. And I was praying to God last week and I said, Lord, help me. What do I need to teach my brothers and my sisters so they really understand they don't have to struggle the manner they are struggling in. Constantly with sin, constantly making efforts, constantly failing every single day and having fingers pointed at us saying hypocrite. Fingers pointing at us and saying you bad person. Fingers pointing at us and saying you sinner. Not from anybody else, but from you yourselves. How many of you have sinned recently? Raise your hands. How many of you have beaten yourself over it? Raise your hands. You have. You condemn yourself. You don't need uh, anyone else to condemn you. You condemn yourself enough. And that's got to stop. And that has to stop here tonight. Okay? I want you to know that the good news really is good news. Say the good news. It's really good news. Amen. Amen. And I'm going to take you to the good news, okay? I'm going to read to you from Mark 2, 13 to 21. And remember what I told you? When you're listening to the Word of God, you need to be there, okay? So are you there? I'm not sure. Stand up. Hands up in the air. Hallelujah. 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 I saw the heavens open. You better believe that God's coming down here in force. Sit down. Are you ready to get what he wants to give you? One day Jesus went out beside the lake. Now I'm going to change a few words in the scripture just to make more sense of it, okay? One day Jesus went out beside the lake. He spent a lot of time at lakes and mountains, peaceful places. We have mountains over here too, lakes here too. And it wouldn't be a bad idea for you to go this evening and spend some time next to a lake or a mountain. A large crowd came to him and he began to teach them. Then as he walked along, he saw Levi sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus told him. And Levi got up and followed him. Not a question, not an argument. He got up and he followed Jesus. Then he invited Jesus for dinner. And when Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. When the teachers of the law who were Pharisees saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? I mean, doesn't he know who they are? Bad people? On hearing this, Jesus said to them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. 
Now, another story following this. John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. And some people came and asked Jesus, how is it that John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees are fasting, but not yours? I mean, your disciples should be holier, right? They should be praying more, fasting more. They should be doing all these kind of things. And why aren't they doing it? Why aren't they acting like everybody else who, you know, look at how holy they are. And your people, they're eating and they're drinking and they're partying and they're having fun. And, you know, you know what I'm saying? Jesus answered, how can the guests of the, bed, of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? They cannot so long as they have him with them. But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them. And on that day they will fast. No one sues a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. Otherwise, the new piece will pull away from the old, making the tear worse. And no one pours new wine into old wine skins. Otherwise, the wine will burst the skins, and both the wine and the wine skins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wine skins. This is the good news. You know what I just did there? If I'd said, this is the gospel of the Lord, everyone knows what to respond, right? I said, this is good news, and nobody wants to respond. Because what did I just do? I just poured new wine into old wineskins. <clears throat> there was this couple who just got married, okay? And one day, uh, the woman... Uh, cooked a pot roast for her husband. And when she cooked it, she cut the sides of the pot roast off. And he was very surprised. He said, why did you do that? And she said, because it makes the pot roast tastier. Now, he couldn't figure out how cutting the sides of the pot roast will make the pot roast tastier. So he said, where did you learn that? And she said, from my mother. That weekend, the mother had come over for dinner and so he asked the mother, is it true that when you cook pot roast, you cut the sides of the pot roast off? And she said, yes. And he asked her, why do you do it? And she said, because it makes the pot roast tastier. And he said, where did you learn that? And she said, from my mother. Now, this man is very curious. And fortunately, this wife's mother's mother is still alive. So she, he picks up the phone and he calls her and he says, is it true that when you make pot roast, you cut the sides of the pot roast before you put it in the oven. And he said, yes. And he said, why do you do that? And she said, because it won't fit in my oven otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> We're like that. We do things and we have no idea why we're doing them. We go to church and we have no idea why we're going to church. We receive communion and we have no idea why we're doing that. We sometimes even pray and we have no idea why we're praying. We just think that if we do these novenas or we kind of, you know, fast for 20 days or do this, God is going to answer our prayers. We're looking for formulas. Jesus was upset with the Pharisees. You know, they were talking about fasting now. He had no problem with fasting. In fact, I think he quite liked it. There was a time he fasted himself, 40 days. Do you remember that? And I'm pretty sure that he thought it was good spiritual exercise too for us to fast. What upset Jesus a lot was they were fasting simply because they were told to fast. It had become a ritual. And they'd long since lost the understanding of why they needed to do it. And they did many things like that. They were very judgmental people. Why? Because they'd started to become holy. They started to give good, live good lives. And they were looking at other people and judging them and saying, hey, we're the holy people. Why? Because we're following the law. We're doing everything the law says. 
The law says do not murder, so we're not murdering. The law says we don't commit, don't commit adultery, so we're not sleeping with anybody's wife or husband. And Jesus one day went to them and said, yo, what was that about not committing murder? You know, you so much has caused somebody an idiot. And you're guilty of murder. And what was that about not committing adultery? You're not slept with anybody's wife. Is that why you think you're so holy? You know, if you so much as look at a woman with lust in your eyes, you're committing adultery. Jesus got angry with them because they pretended constantly to be righteous people when they were not. And sometimes we make the same mistake that they're making. We think we're righteous when we're not. And that's the bad news. The good news is that in him, he makes all of us righteous. Which means that if I think that I'm holy, which I am, not because of what I've done, but because of what Jesus has done for me, then by the same token, you're righteous too. Because what he has done for me, he has done for you as well. Right? And we don't get it here and here. Today, I hope we're going to get it. And for that, I'm going to tell you a little story. An example, actually. A practical example. How many of you have made New Year resolutions? Raise your hands. And actually, don't raise your hands. Everybody does. Yeah? And that embarrassed laugh tells me that you've broken them um, very quickly in 20 minutes of making them. Right? Now, one of the resolutions that most of us make is the resolution to lose weight. Isn't that true? I mean, come Christmas time, New Year time, and we're stuffing and stuffing and stuffing, and you know, oh, the way we stuff. Is that also true? And we say, no, New Year has come. I am going to get fit again. I am going to diet, and I am going to exercise, and maybe you manage to do it for two days. Yes? Why doesn't it work? All these resolutions that we make, why don't they work? We make other kinds of resolutions, and I'm pretty sure that you do because you're all good people. And you come here and you leave here and you say, from now on, I'm going to treat my wife well. I'm not going to shout at her. Instead, I'm going to call her darling, my baby. The wives say, I'm going to do the same thing with my husbands until they look at the husband's face and they say, I changed my mind about that. <laughs> we say, we're going to stop looking at porn and we're going to stop drinking. And we have all these resolutions that we make constantly. But they don't work, do they? They don't work. And so you beat yourself up with a stick. You know, you see, you're a bad person. You're never going to be holy. You're never going to be delivered. You're always going to live this life the way you're always living it. You blame your self-confidence. You blame your lack of willpower. You blame all kinds of things. And it's nothing to do, let me tell you right now, it's nothing to do with the fact that you don't have enough willpower. It's nothing to do with the fact that you lack confidence. It's nothing to do with any of these reasons you give yourself. It has to do simply with the fact that you're trying to put new wine into old wine skins. Old habits that you've accumulated over years and you think one moment is going to change it, nothing is going to happen because you know what has happened over the years? These old wine skins have become hard like rock. And when you try to put new wine into them, when you try to put new ideas into them, they just explode because they can't contain the new ideas because the new ideas have a habit of expanding. Yes? New ideas have a habit of growing. And you're trying to put it in that sack of wine that cannot contain it. So with the result, you lose both the sack and the wine no more. Today, you're going to learn the easy way of doing it. And I like easy because for me, anything that is hard is difficult. You know, it's almost impossible to do. Isn't that true? Unfortunately, I've discovered something called grace. Have you heard the word? I was told a couple of years back that 
uh, by this person who was very surprised and said, a grace preacher in the Catholic Church? And I realized part of the problem is that everything we're taught has to do with the law. Everything we've been taught has been do this and don't do this. And if you don't do this, God is going to get angry and you're going to receive punishment. And that is not the truth. Are you listening to me? And the problem is when we are taught this, we start to teach others this. With the result that everything is about the law. It's not about the law anymore. It's about grace. And I'm going to explain what that means in a moment. Now, the way Jesus has taught me to explain this to you consists of teaching you three R's. Now, you remember when you were small, you were taught three R's? What are those? Reading, writing, and arithmetic. And, you know, only one of them starts with R, but never mind. Now, we're not looking at three um, nouns here. We're going to look at three verbs, three powerful verbs. Okay? Repent, replace, and relax. Can you repeat that after me? Repent. Replace and relax. All of them are going to change your paradigms. What a paradigm is, is an idea that you've had. It's kind of, it's like a wineskin, okay? What is the first thing that comes to your mind when you think of repent? Confession, that's the first thing. Yeah, because you're? Yeah, and you're sorry. Okay? Practically everybody thinks that's what repent means. To kind of feel contrite, to feel sorry. And actually, that is not what repent means totally. Repent comes from the Greek word metanoia, which actually means a change of mind, leading to a change in behavior. And Jesus, after he finished his fast and came out of the desert, you know what he told people? He said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near, which means not just say sorry, but understand that your mind has to be changed. How is that going to happen? When you realize that something you are doing is wrong and you want to correct it, then you say, hey, I don't want to do that anymore. I'm going to do this. And for the longest time, this entire year, I've been talking about how God has moved us out of the world into heaven. What is he saying? You've got to repent and say, I'm sorry that I'm living in this world. You have to say the sorry anyway, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to change my world so that it lives over here. Now, look at the weight thing that you have. The first thing when you kind of say, you know, I need to lose weight, right? I constantly have to struggle with my weight because I love to eat. Some of you love to eat too, don't you? Right? And it kind of piles on. Before you know it, that stomach starts to come out a little bit and you know, every time someone's taking a photograph, I got to suck it in and <laughs> you know what that's like. Yeah, some of you do and you know, you first got to say, hey, I got to lose weight. And that is the repentance that I need to change my mind from saying it is okay to be fat. It's okay to be unhealthy. It is okay to be all these things. I need to change and make sure that I am fit because my body is a temple to the Holy Spirit. Everybody with me? Let me give you another instance, Okay. How many of you believe your security lies in your money? Okay, don't raise your hands. I don't want to embarrass anybody today. But most of us sitting over here believe that money makes us secure, which is why we try to work so hard and try to accumulate enough money so that in case of a rainy day, we have enough money to look after ourselves. Yes or no? There was a man, a rich man who once thought just like you, you know, He was a farmer, and one day he had a huge crop, massive crop. Now, you think this crop would make him happy? No, he started to worry. He said, what am I going to do with all this grain? Where am I going to store it? So then he sat down and had to think about it, and then he said, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to tear down all my old barns, and I'm going to build new ones, and in them I'm going to store all my goods and all my grain, and then I'm going to sit back and relax and make merry for the rest of my life. That night, God came to him and said, you fool. You know, I call you donkey sometimes. You feel bad? No, you don't. Good. God says, you fool. Do you know that tonight you're going to die? Who are you saving all this for? And then Jesus says, this is how it will be. With any of you who are not rich towards God in heaven, but are rich towards yourselves. 
You see the problem here, and this is what I need you to understand. Because a couple of weeks back, I promised you that God is going to bless you. Okay, God is going to bless you in every possible way. And the reason he can't bless you is because you basically think that you're the ones who are doing it all. God says, will you tithe? You know, will you kind of give the first fruit of your produce to me? And you say, I don't need to do that because whatever I am doing is all my hard effort. I mean, I go to work. I wake up early in the morning. You know, I cook breakfast for my kids. I get into my car. I drop them to school. Then I go to work and I slog my... I slog. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and... At the end of the day, I come home tired and all this is mine. So my money, me, I'm going to become a millionaire. I'm going to put it all in the bank and it's all going to be fine over there. And God says, really? Okay. Let's see how it lasts. And then when things start to crumble around you, when your job gets threatened, when you lose it, and there are no finances, you suddenly realize, oh, maybe God has something to do with this. And then you go and you pray and you pray and you pray and... And he says, God, why aren't you giving me a job? And he said, the first time I gave it to you, you thought you got it. So why are you asking me for a job this time? And all this money that you earned, you think you earned it. Why are you asking me for more this time? Are you listening to me? And when you get this understanding in your head, and the reason I'm taking this is because I know this is a tough subject. When you get this understanding, you realize, hey, I'm sorry that I did that. I didn't understand I have to do this instead. And that is the change of mind. That results in a change of behavior or attitude. And that results in new wine being poured into new wine skins. Because you've got a new idea here now. And you're pouring new wine into it. And when you do that, what happens? Jesus says, give and it will be given to you. A good measure. Press down, shaken together, running over, will be poured out into your lap for the measure you use, the measure you give, would be the measure given to you. Are you listening to me? I told you how five or six years ago there was another recession in the country. And I also told you how while everybody else was losing their jobs, our people were getting increments and bonuses and promotions. Not a single one of our community people had lost their jobs because every single one of them had been taught to tithe. Why? Because when we tithe, we acknowledge that God is the source of everything. And when you give to God, the first of what you get, not the leftovers, you're saying, God, this is all because of you, and I thank you for giving me what you've given me, so I give it to you first. And then God says, here is a person who acknowledges that I am in charge. And then to show you that he is in charge, he looks after every single thing that you earn, every single thing that you make. Are you listening to me? Yes. Repentance, when it comes to anything, comes from that. From understanding that, hey, the way you've been looking at things in the past might have been right at that time, but doesn't hold good anymore. So change the way you're thinking, which brings me to R number two, replace. Say replace. replace. What do you think this woman who baked pot roast, cutting the edges of the oven, did after she found out why her grandmother used to cut the sides of the pot roast? Do you think she continued doing it? I'm pretty sure she didn't. I mean, she must have been hitting her head and saying, stupid person. You know, all these years I wasted so much of meat. My husband could have eaten and then he could have worried about diet and the rest of it. And, you know, you know what I'm saying? When you realize that what you're doing is wrong and you continue doing it, that really makes you stupid. You know why they're laughing? Because they know what is coming next. Stupid. Say stupid. <laughs> Go on, humor me. I want you to remember these things. Say stupid. <laughs> Once you've learned there's something that you're doing is foolish and you continue to do it, that makes you stupid. Let us talk about this person who wants to lose weight, okay? Us, me. 
if you're embarrassed, you always think I'm picking on you, me, okay? What do we do? We say, I'm going to go on a crash diet. Isn't that what we do? We say, I'm going to exercise. Isn't that what we do? So we'll buy these new shoes, right? We'll get these new pair of track pants. We'll get a new weighing scale. You know, we stand on it after taking off every single, you know, every single item of garment, including our watches, you know, so that there is no extra weight. We'll do all these things, and maybe for a week, we'll kind of eat well, all right? No Lay's chips, no chocolates, no rice, no, no, all these things that people tell you not to eat. None of that, and for a week, it's great, but after a week, the scale goes under the bed, and, you know? <laughs> Why isn't it working? Because we're trying to put new wine into an old wineskin. And what is the old wineskin? The old wineskin is basically bad eating habits and a lack of regular exercise. So the first thing that needs to be done is a change of terminology. Don't call it a diet. Call it a change of lifestyle. Because a diet is temporary, a lifestyle is permanent. So you understand that if you really need to make this work, and you need to make it work a long time, then you need to change your entire philosophy about the way you eat and the way you treat your body. Is everybody with me? Now, when it comes to spirituality, it's also the same thing. We are trying to fit new wine into old wineskins. And what is the new wine? The new wine is the fact that God has already given you everything you need. And we've been confessing this and declaring this for the last six months, but we don't get it. And what I want us here to understand, the reason we don't get it, is because the two covenants are different. In the old covenant, we were all sinners. In the old covenant, we were all punishable for our sins. In the new covenant, there is no punishment because the sin has been paid for. Are you listening to me? And when the sin has been paid for, then why do you feel condemned? Why do you feel guilty? Why do you feel ashamed? We're constantly hitting ourselves, constantly beating ourselves, and it makes my heart break. I'll tell you how it works, okay? This morning, I got angry with my wife. I kind of bawled at her, and it wasn't a kind bawling either. I just kind of, I had a lot of pent-up stuff in me. It just exploded, and I felt very bad for it afterwards. What is the first thing my wife is going to say? Hypocrite, right? What is the first thing I'm going to say? Hypocrite. Honey, I'm teaching all these things about love and the rest of it. And look at the way you're treating her. And it went on like that for two minutes. Till Jesus fortunately talks to me and says, Anil, look at me. And it's hard to do it because you're upset. You know what it's like when you're beating yourself up. And some of you do that constantly. So look at him. You're not a hypocrite. I love you. You're pure. You're holy. You're right, yes. Okay, you had a bad moment, but I hope you learned something from that bad moment. And I said, what am I supposed to learn? The same lesson you should have learned a long time ago, Anil, is that if you try to do these things on your own, you're not going to succeed. Listen to me. Trust me. Put your faith in me. And I said, okay, Lord. And I kept looking at him, and then I too kind of spend a little more time with her and you know what wives are like they press the buttons and they know exactly what buttons to press right and all the wives are laughing the men should be laughing actually but you know and Jesus kept saying throughout the time look at me and I just looked at him and she went on saying whatever she had to say and I was fine and we need to understand that that we need to replace our entire mindset from being who we think we are to who God thinks of us as. You know, because all the time anyone is condemning, you know what Jesus tells me? You're beautiful. You're wonderful. I love you. You're a saint. You're pure. And that is why I make us repeat this week after week. And I'm going to keep doing this for a couple of years because... We have been conditioned for the last so many years to think of ourselves as sinners, to think of ourselves as bad people, 
to think of God as a punishing God. We have all these ideas that have been ingrained in our heads to the point where we just don't live lives of freedom. And I want that to change. And that is the reason God has been blessing this ministry. Because it is the truth. And the truth will set us free and the truth will bless us. So can we confess it again, all of us together? Say, I'm redeemed. I'm, redeemed. I'm, saved. I'm saved. I'm restored. I'm, restored. I'm, forgiven. I'm forgiven. I am washed. I'm washed. I am cleansed. I'm cleansed. I am pure. I'm pure. I am holy. I'm holy. I am blessed. I am healed in spirit, in heart, in mind, in body. I am free. I am strong. I am victorious. I am a child of my Father. I am a friend of Jesus. I am a temple to the Holy Spirit. This is who I am. And when you keep saying this constantly, you start to believe it. And you need to believe it. Because truly, this is the truth. What did you do last week? It is something foolish. It is something sinful. God is looking at you now and saying, you're holy. Now you want to argue with him? You're going to feel guilty and ashamed when he says, I've forgiven you? What does that tell you about you and your faith in him? You're saying that he's a liar? You're saying that he died for nothing? He's saying, I love you and you're beautiful and you're like a saint. You're holy. I washed you. I washed you with my blood. I made you pure in that blood. Look at you. You're sparkling. You're going to argue with that? I met a friend this morning and the way he was beating himself up and beating himself up. It just hurt me. Because you realize that is the truth for so many of us. We let the devil whisper his lies and sometimes it comes from all around us. God is saying to you, God is saying to you now, you're beautiful, you're holy. And you're listening to the devil. The devil wants you to feel dirty and miserable because then he has you. God wants you to be free. And God wants you to be victorious. And God wants you to be healthy and to be whole. And we constantly struggle, which brings me to my point number three, which is what? Relax. relax. Has anyone taught you this? That the essence of faith is to relax? Instead of constantly striving to do and don't do and do and don't do. And ending up frustrated and miserable. Jesus says, come to me. All you who are weary and burdened. And I will give you what? I'll give you what? I'm going to put more burdens on you. If you don't do this, you're a bad person. If you, you have to do this. And from the time we're little, it begins. They teach us the Ten Commandments and say you have to follow these Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments was given to us for one reason, to show us how sinful we were. And to show us that we can't do anything to keep them. There's not a single person on this entire planet who can keep the Ten Commandments. That is why Jesus told the Pharisees, you think you're righteous because you don't commit adultery? Hey, you so much as look at a woman with lust in your eyes and you're committing adultery. Don't parade your righteousness in front of me because in front of God, in front of me, you're like you're clad in filthy rags. So what did Jesus do? He came and he took away those rags and he gave, me, gave us his cloak and he says, now you're righteous. Now I live in you. And you want to live this holy life, you can do it, but not on your own effort. So stop trying to do it on your own. Come to me. All of you who are weary and burdened, and he's speaking to every person in this church today. Come to me. All you who are tired, and look at your faces. You're exhausted with trying to be holy. Exhausted by trying to be this good person that you want to be. God says you're already good. Come to me and I will give you rest. 
How will you do that? Take my yoke upon me and learn from me. For I'm meek and gentle in heart and there will be rest for your soul. You know what a yoke is? Have you seen cows? Can one of you be a cow for me? You shouldn't have sat in the front. Come. Now, now he's a cow, I'm a cow too. Okay, now watch this. We're yoked together. Have you seen two cows together? No, not us. <laughs> We're yoked together, okay? So now what happens? If cow number one moves, cow number two has to move too, no? If cow number one turns, cow number two has to turn too. If cow number one wants to go round and round and round and round, cow number two has to go. Thank you. He will never sit in the front row again. <coughs> and when he's doing that, I could have kept him here for longer, but I don't want to embarrass him. What is he telling you? I love you. I'm here for you. No, I'm right by your side. The devil is calling you over there, but you're yoked to me. You can't go there. You're stuck to me. And you might want to go, but you can't go. Let's go this side instead. So relax. Are you listening to me? That is what grace means. And that is what our faith journey is all about. You can go back and you can listen to all those rules that you've been taught all these years. Or you can start believing in the gospel, you can start believing the good news. And the good news is this. Jesus has already done it all. You know, we constantly are told, do this, don't do this, do this, don't do this. Listen to me. It has already been done. You know what Jesus said when he was on the cross? It is finished. It is accomplished. Whatever needed to be done, I have done it. Now you can continue to live according to the laws of the Old Testament. And if you live according to those laws, you will suffer the fate of those laws. Those who break them. Or you can start to walk with me here. Filled with my spirit. And that's what he told the Galatians. You know, in my early days, there was so much of grace flowing. You know, I used to be an alcoholic. And I got rid of the alcohol just like that. And I used to be a chain smoker. And God took away that habit just like that. And you know, I had a, uh, over two dozen bad habits and doop, 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 doop. God just started taking them away. And you know what happens when that happens? Suddenly you start to think that you're holy. You know, have you felt that? I know some of you have when you just come to the faith and you start living a good life. You start to think it is me doing it all. And then when that happens, you want to do it all. You want to live this perfect life. You want to live like a saint and you start to put effort into doing things and then God sometimes has to knock you on the head and says, are you trying to do with the flesh what started with the spirit? And that is what Paul said to the Galatians too. He said, how were you saved? Because you were a good person? You were saved because you believed in Jesus. No, you received the spirit because you believed in him, right? And now that the spirit has started this work, what are you trying to do? Try to finish it with your flesh? He says, Relax. And that is what Jesus is telling all of you here to do. Relax. Trust in me. Trust in my love. And trust that whatever I have done is forever. Trust that there is no condemnation for those who believe in me because I don't condemn you. And if Jesus doesn't condemn us, then who is anyone to condemn you? And who are you to condemn yourself? So no more fingers pointing at you. Because why? If God says he is unfine in his eyes, then what do I care what anyone says about me? And that is also a kind of wineskin, you know. The things that people think of us has become such a powerful wineskin that we start to live for them instead of living for God. But when you start to live for God and your eyes are focused on Him and He's with you, then hey, you don't care about the world. Are you with me? This is freedom. This is life in abundance. So live the way that Jesus is teaching you today. It's simple. Repent, replace, and relax. That doesn't mean you kind of put your feet up and, you know, make merry for the rest of your life, but it means stop taking stress in your life. Okay? Now there is one surefire thing to replace. 
And that is self-pity. Do you know what self-pity is? Yeah, you constantly feel sorry for yourself. You beat yourself. You bad person, you bad person, you bad person. And eventually, beating yourself so much, you get depressed. Then you get depressed so much, you feel suicidal. You know, have you met people like that? The life is all rubbish and I want to die. I feel like jumping out of that window, but I'm so depressed, I don't even want to go to the window and jump out. <laughs> need to replace that thinking. And how do you replace that thinking? By saying, I'm not depressed. I'm going to rejoice. And this is a challenge that I'm going to give any of you who kind of sometimes, you know, are depressed and you don't want to praise God. You don't want to replace that mindset. Just try it once. And very often what happens is when you're so depressed and somebody comes to you, the Holy Spirit comes to you and says, praise the Lord. I'm too depressed to open my mouth. What are you saying? Praise the Lord. I don't want to praise the Lord. I don't want to do anything. I want to sit here and die. Stand up. Praise the Lord. No, it's, life sucks. It's miserable. Yeah, but I challenge any of you. You know, when you come in here, I notice many of you are weary. Yeah, you don't know. I know, but I know. I can see it from the looks on your faces. You look like as if <clears throat> the world is going to end tomorrow. It might, but what a joy if it does. I mean, for me it is. I don't know about you. I'm waiting to go home. You're depressed. And then we have this beautiful worship here. And you know how some of you sit? Where's the chair? No, never mind. I'm not going to sit in the chair. They're praising God at the top of their voices and you know what I'm saying? And then I have to come over here and I have to say, say hallelujah. Why you listen to me? Stay where you are, sitting, sitting down over there and no, let everybody else say hallelujah and I'm going to sit over there. Why? Because I'm not in the mood to say hallelujah. Why? Because the life, life sucks and everything is going down the tubes. And you know what I'm saying? And all you need to do is at moments like this is to stand up, open your mouth, raise your hands in the air. Hallelujah! Finish? <laughs> Not bad. You, you took that no. All right. See, look at your faces. You're all smiling. I don't see a single person whose teeth are not seen. Everybody. Yours too. No. <laughs> right? And otherwise, you're just sitting down over there and feeling bad. I'll tell you this. Now, you need to listen to this, okay? You think all the miracles take place during the preaching? Good stuff happens during the preaching. But the best stuff happens during the time of worship. Because when you glorify God, then he comes and starts to move in the presence of his people. And during the worship today, which was very anointed, as in the worship every time, 17 people were healed. Everyone who was healed <laughs> were those who were standing up with their hands in the air praising the Lord. And now the rest of you will feel more depressed sitting over there. <laughs> the point of this story is simply this. There is power in praise. I've given an entire talk on this. I'm not going to go there. But I want to demonstrate to you, okay? We did this in Sharjah two days ago. And I'm telling you, there was a fire there like you would not believe, okay? The entire heaven came down upon the people, right? And people were delivered of just about every habit you can imagine, and I have testimonies that come afterwards, and sometimes these testimonies are things that people don't want to share. You know, I was delivered of pornography. I was delivered of masturbation. A lot of them were sexual habits set free just like that, right? Now, this is what happens during praise. So we're going to sing now. And when we sing now, I honestly want you to just kind of open that heart, okay? Open that mouth and let whatever's in the heart come out. Right? So be loud for 10 minutes. It's not going to hurt anybody. It's not going to hurt you. Right? Look at the way I shout. Did you hear that? What I just did? I can keep doing that. No thanks? No. Yes. Thanks. It's going to happen. All right? So let's all stand up and prepare our hearts for God. We're going to take the same song that we <clears throat> ended today's session with. And I want to say something about this song. All right? 
Paul said, it is not I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. Now Christ is this fortress. Picture a fortress. All of you know what a fortress is? There's a moat around a fortress, which means the enemy cannot come in. And you are in this fortress that is Jesus. Now when you're with Jesus, there is nothing that can touch you. And when you're in this fortress with Jesus, now this is not an old-fashioned fortress with basic necessities. This is a fortress that has just about every single luxury that you can imagine. And there you have Jesus that is saying, all this is yours. Are you listening to me? Now you can choose to be in a hut, depressed, or you can choose to be in this fortress that is Jesus. So just imagine that, you're, you're that. And in this fortress, hey, anything can happen. And today a lot of things are going to happen because you're in it. So are we ready? With all our hearts, we're going to sing. Close your eyes. I'll give you the words so you don't need to keep your eyes open for anything. And all I want you to do is to let the Spirit of God move in you. God gave you the Spirit because it's with the Spirit's help that you can be holy and you will become holy. Actually, let me change that. You already are holy. You're going to be able to do all the things that God asks you to do. Here in this fortress, you're safe. In this fortress, you're protected. In this fortress, you're there with God right in front of you. And you don't need to tell Him what you need because He already needs, knows what you need. He just needs you to look at Him. He needs you to trust Him. Just like the woman who touched Jesus' cloak and was healed. He wants you to have that kind of faith in Him. That you only need to touch His robe. You don't need to do all these things to earn His love. You don't need to do all these things to earn His favor. When you do that, you're relying on the flesh. You're saying, I am the one who's going to do it. And God's glory is not manifest in that. God's glory is manifest in, in simple faith. Faith of a man that says, come, please. My marriage is breaking. Come and help to save it. It's in the faith of someone who says, my child has cancer or my child is very sick. Please come and save her. It's in the faith that says, Lord, I'm struggling and struggling and struggling. And I'm going to lay it all down and at your feet. I just surrender it all to you. My struggles, my desire to be holy, you know it's true. You know it's that. But I can't do it on my own and I've come to realize that. So what I'm doing now is laying it down before you. I'm just going to believe that here in this fortress that is you, you're going to, be, going to make everything right. So let's say, you are my refuge.
you, Jesus, Lord. Everybody, Jesus, Lord. Forgive me for not trusting you. Forgive me for not coming to you when I was in need. Forgive me for relying on my strength, putting confidence in myself. Help me now, Lord, to change my mind and to trust you with a simple faith. Help me, Lord, to replace all those thoughts and ideas that I have been taught and I have believed and I have professed with new thoughts that I am who you've made me now. Let me stop trying to do and let me just be your child, your friend. You don't need to feel anything now. You just need to know. With the faith of the woman who touched Jesus' cloak, that she was a healer, you are healed as well. You just need to know that. Simply being in his presence is enough for him. what brings satisfaction to him. Let him hold you in this beautiful fortress where you can be safe always, loved always, blessed always, protected always. In Jesus you are new, in Jesus you are whole, in Jesus you are saved, in Jesus you are redeemed. Jesus, you're blessed, and Jesus, you're healed, and Jesus, you're free. Be free. Now and forever, be free. Now and forever, be saved. Now and forever, be forgiven. There is no condemnation. It's new wine, new wineskins. It'll take you some time to learn it. Praise you, Jesus. Love you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Praise you, Father. Love you, Father. Thank you, Spirit. Praise you, Spirit. Love you, Spirit. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah.